Good morning, my name is Rochelle, and I would like to welcome you to this worship service at Emmanuel Baptist Church in Willowdale, Toronto. Wherever you are watching from today, I invite you to participate in this service, and I pray that you will feel the touch of God's Spirit as you join us in worship. Let us prepare our hearts and minds as we listen to this morning's prelude. We come to worship the living God who satisfies us with good things. Come, you faithful people of God, and magnify his holy name because the Lord is worthy of our praise now and always. Let us pray. O oh God, our Father in heaven, when we long for what is authentic and for what endures, you show us the way, the truth, and the light. And so we come to worship you today, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Receive all of our praise and gratitude, for you are the living God and the source of all that matters now and forevermore. Amen. Let us worship the Lord.
the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Morning, Emmanuel. This is the time in our service where we bless our children. So join me as we play, pray for the kids of Emmanuel. Thank you, God, so much for this day. Thank you that we have a children's ministry that is blessing the children of Emmanuel. We pray that you bless them, keep them healthy and strong. We pray that they're having a great summer and that they are making great memories with their families. We pray that you protect them and guide them as they uh, continue to have fun and as they prepare for school. In your name we pray. Amen. Good morning. My name is Dave Galloway, and I've been asked to read today's scripture, which is taken from the book of Kings. 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 10 to 12, and chapter 3, verse 3 to 14. 1 Kings 2, verses 10 to 12, and chapter 3, verse 3 to 14. Then David rested with his ancestors and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned 40 years over Israel, seven years in Hebron, and 33 in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. Chapter 3, verse 3. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given him by the father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned increases and burned incense in high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, 
and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people too, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong, for who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Thus ends today's reading, and may God add his blessing to these words. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today, August 15th, 2021, as we journey together through God's Word. I'd like to start with a story that a friend of mine posted recently. She's a kindergarten teacher who has been trying to cope with online teaching. This is, uh, this is what she posted. So we raised caterpillars to chrysalids, then to butterflies, right? We named them, we researched them, we built a habitat, and then planned for their release in a great garden with lots of flowers that we know they like. Sounds great, right? What could go wrong? Well, as they begin emerging from their chrysalids, one falls into the shallow pan of Gatorade. I think it's dead. Its wings are all smushed down and covered with dried Gatorade granules. I talk about it with the children. We feel bad and share our sad feelings. I get reprimanded by a five-year-old for not letting them go free yesterday as she had commanded. Off camera, the newest hatchling falls into the shallow pan right on top of the corpse, who suddenly begins flapping. Resurrection! Out of its sticky death pit, I sterilize water, find a syringe, and spend the next 24 hours rinsing Gatorade's sugar-encrusted wings. The next day, it's fluttering enthusiastic around its habitat. Hooray! Everyone celebrates! Even Little Miss Bossy Pants. Off camera, I take the habitat outside and open the top. A soft breeze, a fluttery start, and out it flies. One, two, three, goodbye, gator. <laughs> Snap. Bird attack. <laughs> In less than five seconds, I watch a completely unrepentant grackle devour Gatorade. What a perfect metaphor for this school year. Watch out for grackles. <laughs> Well, today's scripture reading isn't about butterflies or grackles. 
but it is about a story that started with great promise and ended on a very low note. It is about a career that had a remarkable and promising beginning, but ended extremely poorly. It is the story of King Solomon. Solomon did so many things right, and his reputation spread far and wide. He was a towering figure and a leader in the history of Israel, but sadly, things did not end well for him. Despite his remarkable start as the king of Israel, he was not able to sustain his single-minded devotion to God throughout his reign. So today we explore Solomon's flashes of greatness and learn lessons about following God obediently for all of life's journey. The book of 1 Kings in the Old Testament begins with King David on his deathbed. As his final act as king, he chooses Solomon to be his successor on the throne of Israel. The transition is set. King David, this this great king who is a man after God's own heart, is now leaving his throne to his beloved son Solomon, the king who had become known for his great wisdom and many accomplishments. And as we follow Solomon's story into chapter 3, we we see that he presents sacrifices to God and And the attentive reader will immediately feel drawn to him as he responds to God in a dream. First, in verse 6, he he responds with heartfelt gratitude to God for the demonstration of great kindness towards his father David during his lifetime. And also, gratitude for appointing him himself, Solomon, as his successor. Then Solomon goes on to show God that he is humble and that he's in need of God's help, saying, Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. By saying this, Solomon is recognizing the enormity of his responsibility And he humbly acknowledges his need for God's help. By describing himself as a child or a young lad, he's thinking both about his relative youth, but also his inexperience. This is not only a candid response of the enormity of the task of ruling, it is also a recognition of the burden of duty with respect to God's promise to Abraham when he says, you have chosen a great people too numerous to count or number. This was God's promise to Abraham, and Solomon understands himself not simply as a ruler over the people of this land, but as the steward of this relationship between God and his covenant people. Well, after this introduction, then Solomon presses home his request. Starting in verse 9, he says, So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? Solomon asks for a wise and discerning heart, which means to have the capacity to judge and rule well. Notice that it was not speculative wisdom that Solomon was concerned about, like a a philosopher or an academic. What he asked for was an understanding or discerning heart so that he might be able to govern God's people justly, to lead a government administration in which truth and justice are paramount and where a life in which the fear of God is at its very core. This is precisely the kind of ideal leader that Isaiah envisions as he describes the future Messiah in chapter 11. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes or decide by what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. 
As Solomon recognizes the necessity of leading with these qualities, he shows that and he's striving to be like the nation's true Messiah, a great son of David, not only in name, but also in character and capacity. So Solomon made his request, and God responded very positively. God said to him, since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commandments as David your father did, I will give you a long life. You know, this, this really anticipates the teaching of Jesus that would come many centuries later, Matthew six thirty three. these familiar verses, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Solomon had integrity. He was thoughtful and humble. He was sincere and respectful, and he honored God by seeking his guidance and blessing first before undertaking this monumental task of serving the people as king. What a wonderful start. Solomon was the wunderkind. He seems destined to build upon the legacy of his father and make Israel great again. No, oh, wait, <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to say it that way. Uh, that should be make Israel greater than ever before. Well, I wish I could say Solomon went from strength to strength, and he only improved as time went on. But unfortunately, we know that's not the case. I have a book in my library. The title is Anguished English. It's by Richard Lederer, an English teacher who has discovered that there can be a lot of humor in the mistakes that students make while they're writing their tests and homework assignments. This book is a collection of these mistakes from former students, along with other humorous mistakes that people sometimes make when speaking English, speaking or writing English. So here are some student answers about the Bible. The Bible is full of interesting caricatures. In the first book of the Bible, Genesis, Adam and Eve were created from an apple tree. One of their children, Cain, asked, Am I my brother's son? Moses went up on Mount Sinai to get the Ten Commandments, but he never made it to Canada. <laughs> and in keeping with our subject today, David was a Hebrew king skilled at playing the lyre. And finally, Solomon, one of David's sons, had 300 wives, and 700 porcupines. <laughs> 700 porcupines, that sounds dangerous. The word this student was looking for was concubine, and here's what chapter 11 tells us about Solomon and his many wives. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter, Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians and Hittites. They were from nations which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. And then it goes on to say, he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, 
And his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. Now, for anyone who's not familiar with the significance of that phrase, brides of royal birth, this refers to a common practice among royal families uh, that, that has been practiced for many centuries, including even European royal families until just a few centuries ago. Solomon and his neighboring, and a neighboring king would agree to peace terms between the two countries. And then Solomon would marry a woman from the neighboring king's royal family in order to basically guarantee the treaty. But 700 wives, that is a staggering number. Now, some might credit Solomon for being a master statesman, seeking peace rather than war with his neighbors. But it is clear that his shrewdness in international politics through marriage gradually weakened his resolve to remain faithful to Yahweh and ultimately led many other Israelites as well to worship foreign gods. And 1 Kings goes on to say, the Lord became angry with Solomon because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice. Although he had forbidden Solomon to follow other gods, Solomon did not keep the Lord's command. For all his many accomplishments, which included building the temple, the expansion of Israel's territory, and the construction of many lavish and luxurious buildings. This is the real story of Solomon's undoing. Scholar D.F. Payne summarizes, Solomon exhibited great ability in a variety of fields as a politician, diplomat, strategist, organizer, and administrator he excelled, and his poetry and proverbs apparently were equally admirable. His real undoing was his lack of moderation, his extravagance in his harem, court luxury, and building schemes that laid an impossible burden on his subjects. Solomon tolerated the idolatrous cults of his foreign wives and even had shrines built for them. He began his reign faithful to Yahweh, but he gradually lapsed. It's such a sad ending for this great king of Israel. So what are the lessons that we can learn from the life of Solomon? From his great achievements and also from his unfortunate blind spots. Well, I think I can safely say that there's nobody in our congregation who's ever found themselves in Solomon's sandals, a person thrust into the pressure cooker of international politics and domestic governance at the head of a small nation surrounded by several treacherous and malevolent rulers. We don't know how hard it was for him to resist temptation, nor should we be too quick to judge. Most of us have never faced the kind of pressures and responsibilities that he had to deal with. As a matter of fact, <laughs> we should always exercise restraint before judging other people. For as it has been said, faults are like headlights of a car. Those of others seem more glaring than your own. Nevertheless, the scriptures are also here for our guidance and instruction. And so let's consider what lessons we can learn from this life so that we can not go down the same road that Solomon did. We want to learn what we can so that we can remain faithful and strong in our relationship with God. I think one of the most important lessons that we can see is when we contrast David's life against Solomon's life. Here we have two pillars of the faith in the history of Israel. They were both zealous for Yahweh, the one true God. They both expressed their desire to rule the nation of God's people with justice and righteousness. They were both passionately committed to the construction of the grand temple in Jerusalem. But we should also add, both David and Solomon found themselves drawn into relationships that compromised their integrity. 
In David's case, it was his affair with Bathsheba and the subsequent murder of Uriah to cover up his sin. In Solomon's case, it was his willingness to marry so many brides of royal birth, leading to his gradual desensitization to their idolatry and an incremental drifting away from his undivided commitment to Yahweh. Both David and Solomon sinned, but the response to their sin is what truly sets them apart. When confronted by the prophet Nathan, David was devastated and humbly repented of his sin in sackcloth and ashes. And the genuineness of his repentance is evident for all to see in the words of Psalm 51. And it says at the beginning of the psalm that this was written after David had been confronted by Nathan about his his sin. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions and wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. David responded by humbly acknowledging his sin, sincerely repenting for what he had done and seeking God's forgiveness. On the other hand, Solomon appears to have descended into apostasy so gradually, so imperceptibly over many years, it appears that he was never truly aware of the magnitude of his fall from grace. By all outward appearances, he exhibited flashes of greatness and exceeded the leaders of all the surrounding nations. But tragically, in the end, he had allowed his heart to drift away from his God. Now, you are not a king. You may not even be a person who is in a position of wealth or prestige or power or responsibility like Solomon, but you and I are both susceptible to the possibility of drifting away from our first love. Therefore, we must pay close attention to sustaining our spiritual life in order to remain faithful to him over the long haul. So, I'd like to share with you four signs that should alert you to the possibility that you may be drifting from God. First, if you struggle to maintain your prayer life. Neglecting one-on-one time with God and personal devotion and prayer is one of the most telling signs of a person who is spiritually adrift. Secondly, if you don't take time to read and study the Bible. God communicates us through his word. Prayer and scripture reading go together as we communicate to God and he speaks to us. A quiet time each day is the basic building block of a healthy relationship with God. Thirdly, you don't spend much time fellowshipping with other believers. Now admittedly, this one has a bit of an asterisk beside it due to the pandemic. But it is still relevant. Are you calling to encourage someone or pray with someone in the church? Or are you more likely to turn to Netflix or the 24-hour news channel? God created a body of believers to uplift and encourage one another. When we interact with other Christians, it helps us to build one another up in the Lord. And finally, the sins that used to bother you don't bother you so much anymore. 
You know, we live in a world where temptation to sin is always present. As Christians, we must learn to control our thoughts and actions so that we can keep on the straight and narrow path. Solomon's spiritual decline did not happen in one giant leap, but in a thousand small compromises made over the years. Pay attention to moments in time when you begin to minimize or, or justify thoughts or actions that you've always avoided in the past. Now, I don't want to make light of this, but I always find the words of Thomas de Quincey enlightening, even if they are presented in a bit of a humorous fashion. He wrote, If once a man indulges in murder, very soon he comes to think little of robbing, and from robbing the next comes to drinking and Sabbath breaking, and from that to incivility and procrastination. I think you see the irony with which he speaks. Anyway, this is the main lesson that I hope that you'll take away from the scriptures this morning. Few believers lose their faith through one giant act of defiance against God. In most cases, their attitudes and practices have been gradually drifting for a long time, leading up to the final breakaway from their faith in God. But the truth is, at some point in your journey as a Christian, you are most likely going to feel yourself drifting from God. Life gets hectic and spending 15 or 30 minutes or an hour reading your Bible and praying may seem like an impossible task. The important thing to remember is that you can always come back to God, no matter how far you think you've drifted. Just as in the story of David, when we humbly confess our sin and repent with all sincerity before God. He is gracious and loving, and he will forgive your sin and receive you back with open arms. By returning to God with a humble heart and a willing spirit, we can regain our faith and begin to rebuild a solid foundation on Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I don't want to drift away from you. Forgive me, Lord, when, there is, when distance has come between us. I pray you will restore me and show me your love more and more each day. I know that a life lived with you is a life worth living. Turn my heart back to you, my Savior and Lord. Give me a spirit of wisdom and discernment so that I may live with integrity. May my life be always dedicated to you and to your plans and purposes. For this I pray in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.
How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what will we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Dear children, let us not love with words, but with actions and in truth. This, then, is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask, because we obey his commands and do what pleases him. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. Amen. Morning, Emmanuel. We are so thankful for your generosity in supporting our church and our ministries. There are several ways that you can send in your offerings. You can give online. You can also drop off your offering in an envelope at the church through the mail slot, or you can send it in the mail as well. Join me as I pray for our offerings and for our ministries. God, thank you so much for everything that we um, have and do as a church. Thank you, Gus, for the God, for the great amount of ministries that we have, our volunteers, the staff, everyone involved. Thank you, God, that we're able to serve one another through these ministries, through our services, through camps, um, through so many different things, Lord. God, we just pray that you um, be with us. Help us, Lord, as a church, as we continue to serve you. We pray that you bless um, everyone and our offerings as we um, return to you everything that you've given to us. In your name we pray. Amen.
This is the time in our service where we share our opportunities. We are so thankful and so happy that you've joined us online today for our worship service. As Pastor Jonathan has mentioned last Sunday, the Farsi congregation has already started meeting in person on Sunday's afternoon. The English congregation is going to be getting everything in place for a safe return to services, tentatively planning our reopening for September 12th. Please note, however, that we remain under public health restrictions, including checking in, physical distancing, wearing a mask, and so on. If you are concerned about your safety or the safety of your loved ones, you can continue watching the services at home as they will still be streamed online. One big change this year will be a pre-registration process for attendance every Sunday. In order to ensure we do not exceed the capacity limits imposed by public health, everyone will need to pre-register each week before Saturday noon. More details about the pre-registration process will be published this coming week. We are also so happy to let you know that our middle school camp went really well. We've enjoyed um, our time with the kids in person, obviously socially distanced and stuff. Um, and right now our summer ministries team has been busy doing projects around the church, painting bathrooms and different things like that. Um, so we are looking forward to seeing you hopefully um, in person with face masks and all um, September 12th potentially. This is our benediction for this morning. May we continue to love one another through all things. May we be a community united in Christ, united in our love for him as we worship and gather online and hopefully in the future in person again. May we be there for each other and be a light to the world around us. Mm -hmm.